Welcome to the Logistics Business Virtual Show. My name is Paul Hamblin. I'm editor of Logistics Business Magazine. You've joined one of our expert panels uh, that are running throughout the show. And this panel is on the theme of real-time visibility, both in the warehouse and in the delivery journey. And I'm joined by two experts uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, delighted to have them with us. Um, and I will ask them to introduce themselves in just a second. Uh, just to say, this isn't going to be a formal sales pitch by our panelists. There's going to be no death by PowerPoint, no screen sharing. It's just about talking and discussion and giving you a sense of aiding your decision making processes in the months and years ahead in what, of course, is a very important area of uh, logistics and warehouse and uh, just generally transport as well uh, expertise. So. I think that sort of covers everything. Do our audience, please do use the chat facility to ask questions of our panel and we will get them to reply to those as much as possible. So thank you for that. Uh, so let me just ask both our panelists to introduce themselves. So shall I start with you, Tony? Yeah, good, uh, <clears throat> good day, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Tony Dobson. I'm from uh, Synergy Logistics. We supply the cloud-based best of breed software uh, called Snap for Phil. I've been with the company for about 10 years now and uh, we've grown about 10 times the size in that time so we're doing very well at the moment so very pleased to be here and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Outstanding performance uh, of course Tony um, and we'll give you a chance to explain why in a, in a minute and, and Jorge tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks Paul. Uh, hello everybody my name is Jorge Lopera. I'm the uh, VP of Global Strategy at Farai. Uh, so FAR has been uh, founded in 2013. Uh, FAR really strives to provide customers with uh, actionable visibility, delivery orchestration, and end consumer experience, really from the manufacturer's floor all the way to the end, end consumer's uh, doorstep. And so like Tony, we've also um, been experience, uh, experiencing tri uh, triple digit growth year on year. So uh, certainly um, really beginning to see a, a large scale adoption um, and really the recognition of a need for for visibility technology in, in many organizations. Well, that brings us neatly on to our next point, uh, Jorge. So thank you for that, which is define for us in simple terms, what is real-time visibility? What, what would you what would you call that? Yeah, so you know, I, visibility is real-time visibility is really being able to see um, the the movement of, of goods throughout a supply chain in, in real time. So as as things are happening. Um, certainly, visibility has become really the linchpin in being able to, to deliver on a, a best-in-class uh, final mile experience. And so knowing where a product is um, from, you know, whether it's in Asia um, or even in, in your home country, um, all the way through is, is, is a critical element in being able to predict um, when, when a product is going to arrive and really being able to adapt and adjust to bottlenecks within the supply chain. So. Uh, visibility is really, in short, it's data, and, and data really allows you to, to navigate, um, you know, through the unpredictable, um, which has is, which is certainly uh, become um, really top of mind as we've begun to see a lot of the bottlenecks across the supply chain over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Yeah, unpredictability has become predictable, has it not, over the last two Absolutely. years? Absolutely. And continues to do so. Um, Tony, then, I mean, it's important to point out uh, that you know the the journey of a of a parcel. Let's call it a parcel. Um, you know it, it it's a long journey, and it's not just about the delivery to the customer. It has to begin somewhere, and you know, and at one some point it ends in the warehouse as well. Can you give us spend some minutes telling us about Snap Fulfill and about your your warehouse management system and about how it can improve processes for your customers? Okay, yes, um, it's uh, <laughs> certainly endorsed the volatility. It really has got disorderly recently, uh, obviously with, uh, with COVID and now with uh, the disruption and the growth and the growth of e-commerce markets. So, yeah, I mean, it's becoming more and more important as we get more and more visibility of what's going on in the supply chain that we get this right, absolutely right. And because of social media, and the speed of everything moving. I think the small nuances of reliable real-time data are becoming more and more important to decision-making on the ground. 
Uh, a warehouse manager was quite happy with 90 something right and 90 something of his stock right. That's not the case anymore. That parcel's got to get out there. It's got to be on time. It's got to be delivered when that carrier turns up. The pressure on from Amazon, the next day delivery, well, it's next hour now, is, is just rippling back through the rest of the supply chain. And I think that supply chain managers and warehouse managers now have got to be acutely aware of the demands they are under before it was very, very much a, a slow time, sort of tomorrow will do. Not a manana attitude, but very, very much a, yeah, well, okay, it'll, it'll get done. And okay, if we miss a few deliveries, that is never, ever the case anymore. I think the pressure uh, on the supply chain and on that parcel delivery is just ever more, um, well, it's growing ever more. And, and uh, the, uh, the pressure on the accuracy of delivery, the accuracy of contents, making sure you pick exactly the right thing. And Snap for Phil, we, we've been doing that for years, so it really is playing into our strengths. So, so what does what is Snap fulfill? Give us, give us, a, give us a, a, a description for the uninitiated on what it is and what it does. Okay, yeah, it's a it's a cloud-based WMS. Everybody knows that uh, about WMS is in the warehouse space. We we compete at a tier one level with the Manhattans and the JDAs of the world. So we we like to say we control everything inside the four walls of a warehouse. So we control the goods in, making sure that that's as reliable whether it's returns or, or goods coming in from suppliers. So that's all about uh, visibility in the supply chain, making sure we put it away in the most optimal way. And, and with the labor shortages coming up, that, that is getting more and more important as we then go to go and pick the stock and replay the stock into pick faces. And um, the, the pressure has always been on to have a world-class WMS that can do all those accurate things to you know, a 99.99 percentage of accuracy. Yeah, we have lots and lots of stock taking and stock checking in Snap Fulfill to make sure that everybody feels happy that they've got the right stock. That then helps us with visibility. So now what we're finding is that ERPs that used to be the, this is the biblical picture of what our stock is and in the warehouse, we find buyers, sellers, order control people are all using the visibility that they can get through a, a system like Snap Fulfill to say that is the biblical truth. If Snap Fulfill says it's there, it is there. If Snap Fulfill says it isn't there, it isn't there. So yeah, picking, packing, and and order management and the order. I think the order profile now is really really important, as particularly uh, B 2 C uh, is starting to appear in manufacturers, whereas they've never delivered directly before. We've had big big drinks companies like Pepsi and Coke approaching us, you know, to, to deliver to you and me, not, not to Tesco's or Walmart in the US, not to anybody anymore. So that pressure's on, the e-com pressure's always been there and that is what Snap for Phil was invented to do, was, was uh, uh, help the e-com businesses to, to get things out quickly. Um, so it's just a rounded WMS. Mm. And can I ask how many implementations you've done around the world? Um, yeah, we've just we've just actually done our Gartner briefing, so I know that exactly. It's two hundred and four um, mm -hmm. on every continent. So recently gone into Australia, into India, and our first one in South Africa. Astonishing. So, yeah. so presumably this is a flexible system, Tony. Otherwise, it, you wouldn't have two hundred of them out there. You could you can configure for, for for sort of any customer, right? What's the sort of breadth of customer uses that we see it used for? Which sec in terms of sectors? Um, yeah, we've very much started on the small to medium enterprises, um, the e-com businesses, the small 3PLs. In the last couple of years, we've, we've gone into large manufacturers like Dr. Martin's Shoes, um, ILG, which are part of the UC Logistics Group. They're running this out to two, three hundred of their clients in nine warehouses in the UK and Poland. Um, we've got Eco Labs in the US, which is our largest client there. $187 billion turnover business. And, and we're running out around the world with them as well to Dominican Republic, Malta and all over the place. So from being a small little WMS that sort of concentrated on the SME and the speed of implementation, um, the larger companies now are thinking, well, we want the same. We want that flexibility. We want to do a pop-up warehouse in another country. We want to do uh, more efficient, more accurate, 
pick in and get those customer services levels up to the e-com levels and that that's where we're being driven and is it restrictive you know you, you made the point that you started out with the sme so presumably you've started out with cost as a you know if you wanted to make it affordable is, is that does that remain the case for and what are your payment options yeah i mean co cost is everything when you're an sme particularly 3pl so we have lots and lots of cost options there we do what's called a bundled SaaS, where you just pay a monthly payment and we do capex for the larger businesses so we've had to become super flexible with with how people pay for things but the main core of what we do is is what we call bundled SaaS, which includes hardware equipment as well on a lease so you just just basically leasing everything so cost cost was everything so we also concentrated on implementation times so we made sure that our implementation was as slick as possible and uh, we've now gone into products like walk me and teach me where we can do remote implementations and lucky we did that otherwise we wouldn't have had a business because yeah. when covid happened nobody wanted you on site and as most people know, implementing without actually seeing a warehouse is tough. So we, we employed videos, we got people to do um, remote training and remote implementation. And now I'd say 60, 70% of our implementations even now are remote and even go lives are remote. So it really has taught us and we, were, we, we got ready for that three or four years ago to keep costs down for everybody. And it actually paid off for us in COVID because we were ready for it. Sure. And, you know, we're going to talk to Jorge in a minute about delivery management, but how does, how does your software, how does that integrate with, with, soft, with, with packages provide, you know, used by delivery providers? Um, yeah, we have, um, we have aggregator relationships with most of the big aggregators in the US and in the UK. So we've got carrier integrations back there. We've got integrations into ERP. When, when you're a standalone WS like we are, where you're expert, TZ is just in one box, you've got to have fantastic relationships and fantastic integration, which is exactly what we've got. We use a, an industry-wide product called Jitterbit that basically talks to every uh, major uh, ERP and order management system in the world. And we just have one interface back down to there. So we keep the costs really low and we talk in there. And also we have a product called Snap Data um, where we, we are providing that visibility to, to those carrier systems and the visibility systems that are out there now. So that data can just be uh, uh, washed up into a data lake quite easily. So we, we spend a lot of our time now doing a lot of that uh, visibility profiling. Right, and you can integrate with what you're saying is you can integrate with almost any system that's out there, basically. Yeah, we, we, it's surprising. You keep saying we've got everything, and, and yet this week we've had three I've never heard of carrier integrators so it's a big market out there but yes we've got the main players uh, all boxed up yeah okay thank you for that for the moment tony so coming coming on to you jorge we're now going out of the warehouse and we're going into the, onto the delivery onto the transport delivery and i think this is where far eye comes into its own right so why don't you spend some minutes telling us about what what you do and how you make a difference for customers here yeah, no, absolutely. So I think far, far I, a good way to start is really our, our, th our three core principles. Um, and so really the, the first one is around configurability. And so recognizing that our customers have vastly unique um, and different workflows that they want to execute as part of how delivery is, is, um, is done is certainly a key element of what we do. So um, that's a, a main piece of it. The, the second one is around predictive intelligence. And so how do we use all of the data that we're aggregating to be able to make intelligent routing decisions um, and intelligent allocation decisions, right? So it's, uh, it's one thing to just hand over parcels to, to a carrier, whether that's internal or external. It's another thing to be able to use machine, and, uh, machine learning to be able to understand, you know, what's going out on, on the road, um, you know, the time of day, what type of uh, commodity you're delivering, uh, where are you delivering, um, all of that will help drive more efficiency um, and better utilization of delivery assets. Um, and then that leads into the third point, which is really around sustainability. And so one of the things that we wanna make sure that we are doing is allowing our customers um, to really make a difference um, in, in being more environmentally conscious and friendly. So 
um, you know, increasing first attempt deliveries, uh, driving more of that visibility to the end consumer where there's more prediction and real time uh, updates. So, so they're ready and those first attempt deliveries can be made um, at a higher frequency than not. Um, and then really just all that we're doing around our routing um, to really reduce the carbon emissions to um, make sure that we are um, we are really able to not only integrate within uh, current fleets, uh, gas powered vehicles to now being able to work across electric vehicles um, and, and really other um, other delivery assets that, that really kind of drive some of that point home um, around being more environmentally conscious. So what and a del delivery management information, give a rundown for us the sort of information that the delivery management app will provide for the user, for the driver, for, for whoever, you know, whoever we're talking about here. Yeah, so, so I think for the, um, I guess it all depends on the persona, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the delivery information that we were effectively providing um, is, is really just around the attributes of the, of, so for the operator, the attributes of the parcel, right? So making sure that if it's oversized versus, uh, you know, not, do you require, you know, a one person or two person um, delivery crew to be able to execute that delivery? Um, you know, for the drivers, it, it will be basically what's going on on the road. Um, you know, are there accidents? Is there, you know, last minute delivery instructions from the end consumer that they need to be aware of uh, to be able to successfully um, make that delivery? And then for the end consumer, they're getting, you know, information on, you know, what is the ETA? Um, if there's delays, right? Uh, being able to offer rescheduling options, uh, being able to reroute your package if you're no longer at home and you're maybe, you know, at a friend's house two, two blocks down the street. Um, so really in for the information that they're receiving are really around how to influence uh, how their delivery is made um, and being able to have choices to, to really pivot if there's some sort of a change in the circumstance that they need to be, uh, they need to communicate to, to their delivery driver. Right, and I, I suppose this would probably be an unanswerable question, but I want to ask you anyway, if I may, which is, do you have any evidence or data which shows how many road miles are being saved for, from any journeys or, or, you know, how journeys have been optimized, delivery routes have been optimized simply by the learnings from Get Far Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're certainly, um, you know, we strive to be able to improve um, vehicle capacity. So reduce the amount of trucks that need to go out on the road. So we do measure that for our customers. Right. Um, you know, we are all, we also look at, you know, first attempt deliveries. Um, so how we're improving those. So product doesn't have to go back and then redispatched out the following day. Um, we are also, uh, we've recently implemented uh, sustainability dashboards. Um, which allows the end user to be able to understand what is the environmental impact on that routing for that day, um, which obviously will then influence based on business rules, um, how environmentally conscious do you want to be, um, you know, when pushing out a, a given route for that day. Uh, so, so there are certainly um, a lot of ways that we are able to provide some of those tangible KPIs back to our customers, um, you know, based on some of the decisions and the workflows that they've established. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to advise them on how to drive continuous improvement across the areas that are most important to them. So asking you the same questions I asked Tony, how many, how many systems have you got implemented around the world now? Yeah, so we have, uh, we have about 150 customers um, across uh, 30 countries uh, today. So uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of uh, installations and, and we really work across uh, various uh, verticals, um, if you will. So we, we have customers in the in the QSR space, uh, logistics, retail, um, e-com, uh, food and grocery. So uh, we really cover the gamut um, as far as the different industries that we serve. Um, and I think that's really a large testament to to how far I is, is built, um, which is really it's, it's a highly configurable system. So we can certainly modify the workflows if you're trying to deliver a pizza versus trying to deliver a couch. Um, and so um, that's that's really one of the things that that allows us to scale quickly um, and really begin and uh, allow us to implement um, even faster for our customers. And integration with other systems is, is something presumably, as, as, as Tony was talking about, that's presumably something that you're comfortable with. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the power of the ecosystem is critical. Uh, so, you know, certainly being having integrations with uh, with WMSs, uh, having delivery uh, integrations with other delivery partners, right? So, uh, when we want to help our customers augment their fleets uh, from internal and external, uh, certainly having a robust uh, carrier base is something that's important to us um, and something that we're constantly striving to to build and grow across the globe. Um, and even if I take a step back and look at, you know, some of the, we have a lot of carrier integrations with uh, ocean freight, um, air, air cargo, et cetera. So it allows us to really have a comprehensive, um, you know, visibility platform. And, and we only accomplish that through those integrations. Sure. And in terms of, I'm just thinking about a, a delivery company that, for example, might have a high turnover of drivers, let's say. So how the user interface for for day-to-day -day users of the of the software are you, are you comfortable that it is something that can be easily taught easily trained i have uh so so fortunately um before joining far i was actually a customer of far so i actually was on that side of the house uh training drivers and getting them up to speed and and uh and quite frankly within 10 minutes um a driver is able to manage the app and, and go out and, and do deliveries um, and so I've been able to test this all, all over the world and uh, it's been pretty consistent um, outcomes. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I think the, you know, as, as uh, Tony mentioned earlier, the, um, you know, the challenge with, uh, with workers and, and really shortages, uh, you have to be able to have technology that's going to not only, um, you know, allow organizations to do more with less, but also there has to be a built-in expectation that the, that turnover is something that, is part of the business and and really the the cost of ramping up a new associate is is one that we have to be cognizant of and one that we have to support our customers with sure um i think we talked about yeah we talked about cost models etc i mean what you know let's we'll throw this back to both of you now broader questions what advice do you give to customers that are embarking on this journey of 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 wanting to upgrade their systems or upgrade their processes, what are the things they should be doing and should not be doing? Let me let me give Jorge a break and start with you there, Tony. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there, there is a lot of uh, dinosaur systems around, as we call them in, in warehousing, and a lot of people sat thinking that they're, they're quite comfortable. I think uh, the cost of change now is, is inevitable. Um, you've got to get onto a modern configurable system. That's one of our uh, key points is that it's self-configurable. We've got people rolling out all around the world on their own now with our software, which was unheard of in WMS. And, and, and I think the, the big thing is that these pressures are just going to continue and efficiency has got to be everything. It, it's, it's, I started in warehousing 30, 40 years ago. Like I said, a very, very slow paced. Oh, yes, we can do that. And the speed of change in the last four or five years to, to having that visibility and the pressure that's on people is amazing. And, and that is reflected in, in, in labor. I mean, the, the guys in the warehouses now can demand almost whatever salaries they want. They move around regularly. They're, they're uh, you know, the, the companies that we are dealing with are looking at the good software as part of making it easier for them to do the job. And, People, people naturally uh, stay in a place where it's comfortable, well managed, and the software is easy to use. So we've been concentrating a lot on on efficiencies to do with uh, the the UI, how it works, and how how many people you actually need to do a job. So, <clears throat> so we're doing a lot of data mining and a lot of analysis on efficiency, and we're getting sort of thirty to forty percent labour savings, which if you think you're probably getting that turnover in a month in a in a busy warehouse, then we are we are vital um, to saving people uh, from from basically having to restrict their business growth. Sure, and Jorge, would you you'd echo that presumably? Anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. So Tony hit on a, on a few of my points. So uh, yeah, I won't I won't repeat those. But I think really, you know, to to really hit on Tony's last comment, which is really understanding and, and knowing what you want to achieve and what you're looking to to uh, to solve for as part of implementing new technology, whether that is, you know, increasing uh, consumer satisfaction, uh, reducing operational costs, uh, being able to, um, you know, combat turnover. 
uh, which obviously uh, factors into to costs or whether that is um, really being able to introduce new service levels or capabilities into the market. And, and so really keenly understanding, you know, what are those levers of value that you're looking to achieve um, and not just implementing technology because you feel like you have to. Um, and, and those are the things that, that we generally will ask our customers is, you know, what, what does success look like for you? Um, and understanding what that is um, at the onset really allows us to solution um, and also provide feedback in, in how you can do things better and, and leveraging learnings from, you know, our existing customers or, or other customers in a specific industry um, you know, allows us to be able to, to really uh, achieve speed to value. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, listening to you, it's, it, it, it's wonderful. Well, I'm sort of green with envy, these en enviably successful businesses that are on this sharp growth. But what's the other side of that? What are the challenges you face? Let me ask you, Tony, what are the things that perhaps are the obstacles to growth for, for, for Synergy and for Snap Fulfill, if any? Um, obviously, co competition never never stops. Um, that 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 is always always um, a thought in our mind is to what are the people are doing. But we are like a, a good football manager would say we're confident in our team. We know we're doing the right thing. We've got a a constant roadmap, um, and that's got to change. Anybody in software now who stands still is going to be out of business very soon. You know, you could probably get away with a couple of years of not investing in R and D and keeping you really at the at the bleeding edge of your of your technology stack. We are at the bleeding edge of our technology stack. You know, we're looking at robots, AMRs, all that sort of thing, which save labour, make it more efficient. And we're at, we've actually invested in our own robot. We're that keen on on technology as a solution. But going back to what Jorge says, you've really really got to think about what you want to do. And how you want to do it we we have got to the point now where we're growing so quickly we actually do a risk matrix on our clients before we sign them just to make sure they're in the right place because a lot of people are just buying technology and not thinking about how right. they're going to benefit from it and that is a real high risk to us because then you get failed implementations and we just don't want that we can't afford to have that we're we're a company and make sure we always implement and I think the thing that stops us growing any faster is, is, is gone now. We've got remote implementation, self-training, so we can grow at the pace we want. We just need to keep our product up to date and relevant. That's, one, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Tony. And anything to add to that, Jorge? No, I think Tony hit, hit on many of the key points there. Um, you know, certainly, you know, competition is, is something that, you know, we're very, very cognizant of. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly always looking to continue to innovate um, and continue to solve for not only customers' problems today, but what we perceive them to be tomorrow. Um, and so really, uh, you know, staying ahead of, of, uh, of what challenges we foresee coming down the pipe are, are certainly um, something that, that we're, we're constantly thinking about as a business. Um, but, but outside of, um, outside of that, I think Tony hit on all the, all the key points that, that we were, were also experiencing as well. Well, I can't let you go. I think we're at the end of our time, but I can't let you go without asking you, you know, being both such a state of the art innovators, what's coming down the track. I don't mean that you need to tell me exactly what product is being launched, you know, two months time or something like that, but I'd like to know about what sort of trends we can expect in each of your sectors. So perhaps with Tony inside the warehouse and with Jorge outside the warehouse in the delivery sector, what might we see happening in this sector in the next, I don't know, one year, five years? Okay, um, we're, we're looking at um, technology to replace RF equipment so people don't have to go around with that. We're looking at Google Glasses-like um, applications. So we think within the next year, we'll have completely got rid of uh, big computers wandering around in a warehouse with a scanner on, just a small scanner and a pair of glasses and a, and a voice activated terminal. Uh, we see that as, as the sort of next year, that's definitely gonna happen. There's some technology coming along. We're just waiting for a manufacturer to start manufacturing that sort of thing. So that will- it was, so, Sorry to interrupt you, Tony. You're saying we'll see the end of the handheld scanner. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, Honeywell and people like that better start counting the money now because there ain't going to be a lot. There's going to be little devices attached to people because you need a power supply. These mm. glasses, like any, like your watch, they run out in 
in hours rather than days. So yeah, the, there's power consumption problems. They're, they're being got rid of. So yeah, I think we're seeing the, hen, the end of the handheld terminal and we're seeing the introduction of a lot more robotics. And that's what we've been looking at for the last five years, actually, the robotics element. And we're, we're just going to relaunch our uh, AMR at uh, Modex in, in, at the end of March. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to that and to seeing that. So thank you for that, Tony. And Jorge, new stuff. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. Um, so the first one, I'll, I'll go back to, to really the, the sustainability um, aspect. So obviously that is now driving uh, consumers' behavior in, in who and in what vendors or retailers they, they decide to do business with. So you're beginning to see a, a pretty uh, sizable movement around, you know, now delivery with EV vehicles, um, you've seen, you know, drone deliveries are now, you know, beginning to, to gain a little bit more traction than they have in years past. Um, and so really alternative channels um, are, are something that, you know, we are continuing to see uh, more and more of that through our customer base um, is one thing. And we're, we're constantly innovating uh, and being able to write optimized by, by the range of a vehicle, right? That those are obviously different elements that we didn't consider maybe three to four years ago. Um, the other thing is really around what I call the 30 minute supply chain. And so everything's becoming hyper local um, right now, being able to source um, and, and orchestrate an order itself uh, takes a lot of uh, a lot of maneuvering, a lot of data, a lot of uh, connectivity to your point on kind of ecosystems um, and then really being able to to execute the delivery side of that uh, within a, a much shorter period. Um, albeit a smaller delivery radius, um, is something that, you know, I see a, a, there's a lot of investment going into uh, hyperlocal, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's uh, micro fulfillment, pop-up sure. store, as Tony mentioned, uh, fulfillment from brick and re retail, right? Re really being able to repurpose a lot of those assets, even parking lots are now serving as, uh, as, a, uh, as a method um, to fulfill uh, orders. So, um, that's something that we are we are very much working on, um, right? Through the partnership channels, through capability um, builds, through partnering with organizations like Tony's um, on the WMS side. So that's uh, certainly a couple of trends that we're we're looking at today. Well, those were really meaty answers. So thank you for those. Um, it's taken us to the end of our time. So. As I say to our audience, if you have any further questions, please do put them in the chat facility within the uh, within your screen there. Uh, otherwise, you can contact Logistics Business and we will contact our panelists for you if you wish. And other than that, just to thank our two panelists, Jorge and Tony, for your great expertise. And I look forward to seeing you both again soon. So thank you very much.